All right, I want to talk to you a little bit uh, about building the church. Jesus is talking to me about building his church, and uh, so I want to talk about what he's talking about. So we're going to do it for a little while. I don't know how long, you know, I, I started out that we're meeting with God. It was going to be just a little whatever in Exodus 33. That was in April. <laughs> if you're not aware, this is the end of September, and we just finished that series last week. I do want to thank also Richie Seltzer for coming and uh, sharing the word. And man, what a great word on evangelism and sharing the heart of God. Um, yeah, I'll say more on that in a moment. So let's get our Bibles out. We love the Bible. We get excited about the Bible here at the Rhodes Church. So if you've got them, open them up to Matthew chapter 16. <laughs> that was pretty weak. I was saving my voice. I, I, had, I lost my voice last week and I didn't have it till uh, Wednesday or Thursday. And I just flew back into town last night. Uh, so I was trying to, I was at a conference all week and so I just got back into town last night and tried to get my voice back and then I was trying to save it. And uh, so I'm, I'm not wooing a lot, but you should have been. <laughs> Too late. So anyway, Richie, <laughs> I want to say this about Richie because it goes along with, I believe, what the Lord's going to speak. Uh, what a heart for evangelism he has. And I want to tell a story about getting to witness it firsthand. He stayed over on Monday and flew back on Tuesday. So Monday, he, uh, we went to the store, and he wanted to get something to eat. And so I took him to a place to eat, and then we went to the grocery store. And so we went to the grocery store, and we walked in, and I'm pushing the cart. And I see right away this guy, he's got uh, his hair is kind of shaved on the side, long in the back. It wasn't Blake, but it looked like same haircut as Blake, and uh, he was with a lady, and I just saw them, like, okay, interesting haircut, and thought it's like Blake, and you know, it just made me think of Blake, so I just warm part of my heart right there, and so, so I, we walked on, and we go around, we're th through the veggies area, and we come around, the details that don't matter, and we see the guy again. And I'm like, oh, there he is. And he turns, he goes back to me, and I see on his shirt, it says, I'm nobody's puppet. I'm like, I wonder what that means. But I didn't think anything about it. So I, we go on, we keep walking around, and we come around, come around to the end to get checked out. And here he comes again with a lady. And, uh, and Richie's walking beside me, and I'm pushing the cart, and all of a sudden I look beside him, and Richie's gone. I'm like, where'd Richie go? Well, Richie had stopped the guy that I had seen now the third time. And he said, hey, I'm a Christian, and Jesus sometimes tells me things, and I just wanted to tell you that Jesus uh, told me to tell you emphatically how much he loves you dearly. And the guy said, okay. And he said, hey, hey what's your name? And the guy said, I, I, I got to get out of here. Well, he didn't get out of here because we were in the store longer than he was. But something in him was wanting to get away from something in Richie. So we got out, and I was curious, and I said, Richie, I want you to tell me what was going on. How did you know what was your process for stopping and talking to him? And he said, well, I noticed him. No, no, I'm sorry. I, God highlighted him to me. I'm like, oh, he highlighted him. What does that mean? <laughs> to you. You know, I could s suppose what that means, but he said he highlighted me. My idea of highlighting was, uh, goes across his head in a big banner in neon, says, Talk to him, Chad, with my name spelled correctly and the right font and everything. I said, what does highlight mean to you? And he said, well, I noticed him. I'm like, noticed him? He said, did you notice him? I said, yeah, I guess. <laughs> I said, I did notice that his shirt said, I'm nobody's puppet. And he said, well, I didn't notice that. So that means I noticed more than you noticed, and I responded less than you responded. That's what I felt. Thank you for sharing my conviction. Why am I saying that? I'm saying that because I think, because there were a bunch of other people in the store, and I don't remember any of their haircuts. I don't remember any of their shirts. 
but I noticed his. And God used that as an opportunity to teach me what highlighting is to God. So when you see someone and you notice them, that is your signal that God wants you to do something. I said, well, what were you going to say? He said, I had no idea. I just knew God told me to approach him. I said, well, what were we going to say after you approached me? I said, I didn't know. I was going to figure it out. Man. <laughs> so I just want to give compliment to my friend Richie and uh, for bringing tremendous conviction into my heart. <laughs> but I, let's read this in Matthew 16. It goes along with what we're talking about, I promise. I'm going to read in verse 13. Man, where does the time go? Verse 13. Um, yeah, when Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples saying, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? What, I'm going to paraphrase, who does everybody else say that I am? Or what do other people say about me, right? What do other people believe about me? What do other people say? What is other people's opinion about me? All of those things could be applicable. So they said back to Jesus, some say you're John the Baptist, some Elijah and others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But he said to them, Jesus said to them, powerful question, but who do you say that I am? There's one thing what everybody else thinks, what everybody else's opinion is, what everybody else says, but their opinion doesn't matter your opinion matters to him. What everybody else says about church or Christianity or Jesus, none of that matters between you and God. The only thing that matters is what do you say about Jesus. So Peter pipes up and he says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. You know what's powerful about this verse? He says, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. So everything that we know about God, it's because God shows us. Before we get too high and mighty in our knowledge and what we know, everything we know about God is only because God tells us. If he doesn't show us, we don't know. So we say, well, I know this about God. I know that about God. That's only because he showed you or he told you. So anything we have is because God reveals to us. Does that make sense? So it's a great answer, Simon Barjona. That's awesome. But the only reason you know is because my God, my Father, showed you. So then, and I also say to you, still talking to Peter, that you are Peter, and not Simon. Simon means to waver. It's fluid. Simon fluctuates. Simon is a word that, that begins to bend or takes on. Simon speaks of something that can be, will take on the shape of something else. It's more fluid. So it contours itself to its surroundings. It flexes wherever it goes, and it becomes formed by what it's close to. That's Simon. But Peter means rock. Rocks don't change shape to things around them unless they're chipped away at or something like that. So I'm going to change your name to Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. Let me look at the word build here for a moment. The word build means to be a house builder, to construct or make something by combining materials and parts. So being a builder, I will build my church means I'm going to put pieces together, I'm going to put parts together, different materials together, and we're going to construct something, take other things, make them into something different. I'm going to build it. And building speaks of a process. Everybody love processes? Yes, we love processes. We don't like processes. We like destinations. We like end results. We don't like 
We, wanna, we like being there. We don't like going there. We like arriving, and, but we don't like going. So we like to hurry up and leave so we can hurry up and get home. Can we go? Let's go. Let's go. We got to get there. We got to get there. We got to get there. We don't enjoy the journeys of things. We enjoy, we enjoy the arrival of things. That's a problem in the kingdom of God because God loves journeys. He loves processes because our problem is and our thinking is we, we think that there are destinations with God like things that need to happen, things that we're believing for, things we're expecting like this. Maybe when this thing happens, there's something out there, some big thing that's going to happen and when that thing happens, then my life will be complete. I'm just telling you there is no such thing. Is that encouraging? We are chasing a carrot of a destination that does not exist. That when I get that job or I, I, get, I walk in my purpose and my calling, my, my destiny, and I, I finally get to that place of what God created me to do, when I'm finally doing that, then everything will come together. <laughs> Wrong. Because our destination, our, we were not created to arrive at a destination of a thing. We were created to become with a person. Our destination is a man, a God-man named Jesus. My destination is not a job. It's not a calling. It's not a purpose. My destination is him. So if you are with God right now doing what he's asked you to do, even if you think there's more to it, if you are in the will of God, let me encourage you, you are exactly where God wants you to be. There is no greater fulfillment in life than being where God last told you to be. To be with him is to walk in fulfillment. To do something for him that he's not with you is not fulfillment. So I can, I can do something for God, but if I'm not with God, it's empty. So he says, I'm going to build things, and I like processes, so enjoy the process. So what does he build? I will build my what? What's the next word? I'll build my... By the way, if you're looking for sermon notes, there aren't any. I'm giving you to them right now. So get out your paper. Write them down. It's the only time you should be on your phone is you're on your notes typing these in. There's no sermon notes on you version either. I flew in yesterday and been gone since Wednesday. So I'm giving you right off the cuff paper stuff right now. You really, <laughs> I will build my, what, what's the next word? I'll build my church. Is he talking about a building? Because when we talk about church, we're talking about a building. Hey, I'm going to go to, right, where are we going to go? We're, we're going here. Now, can this be a building? I understand. I'm not trying to make it where you can't call it. What do you call this place now? You can still call it church. <laughs> and I'm going to go to that building there on that property that we worship in. That would get weird. You can still call it church. But what he's talking about, I will build my church, he's not talking about that. It's a Greek word, ekklesia. It's a Greek word that built up of two words. One, ek, which means out of or originates out of. Kaleo means called, so you put ek out of, kaleo, called, ekklesia means called out ones. A further definition would be worded this way, a assembly or a governing group of people called out to change the culture of a region to match the culture of the one who empowers them. I will build my church. So church is not a building. Church is people. Okay? So he's building his church, his bride. The Bible calls it the bride of Christ, the church. He's the head of the church. And so he says, I'm building up people. I'm building up people who are, let me read that to you again. These people are a group called out to change the culture. Called out of what? Called out of this culture, 
called out of this way of life, called out of the world, called out of that to change the culture to match the culture of the one who empowers them. Did you get all of that? So we, if we are the church, we are people who have been called on assignment out of the world to change the culture to match not the culture of what we want, not the culture of what we think is right, the culture of the one who empowers him. So we don't get a vote on what the culture is supposed to be like. We get to read and say, yes, sir, you say, make this culture like your culture. So I need to know his culture before I can change this culture. Because if I only focus on what I think is wrong with this culture and I don't focus on what is right about his culture, I will get screwed up trying to change this culture. That was a lot. I hope you got it because I can't repeat it. (laughs) We need to know his culture so well that when we interact with a culture that is against his, we have one thought, change it. This is wrong. What am I talking about? We're not supposed to engage this culture and blend in. We're supposed to engage this culture and stand out. If you and I profess to be a believer, a Christian, and we don't stand out, we're not, at the bare minimum, we're not fulfilling our assignment. So what is our assignment to change culture to match the culture of the one who empowers us? So do we have, let me, let me build this this way. Who said he was going to build the church? Jesus. So who is the church? No, we are the church. That's, Jesus is a great answer, but it's, so Jesus is building the church. Who is the church? We are, people are the church. So He's building the church. Now whose culture is he building the church based on? His or ours? His. So what the culture does, no matter how the culture evolves, it does not matter. Well, culture's changing. Who cares? Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So we don't adjust his culture because this one is changing. We bring his culture into this one and we take it and we bring it to match his. What does that look like? Do we do that by, how do we do that? Let's just say, how do we do that? We do that through influence. What does influence look like? I'm glad you asked. Influence looks like when this culture spits hate at you, we take that and we're like, huh, I know this culture so well, when I experience hatred, I recognize it does not come from here. So because I recognize it does not match the culture of the one who empowers me, my instant thought should be, should be. Should be, when I experience that, my job is to change it or influence it. Hatred comes at me from someone. I'm not supposed to bring hatred back. That's of that culture. I'm supposed to bring something to this culture from that culture because I'm empowered to do it. I may not want to do it but I'm empowered to do it, what am I supposed to bring? The Bible says to love those who hate you. Hatred comes. I go, wow, that's cool. (laughs) Maybe not. I'm supposed to influence hatred with a different culture. So I bring love back towards hatred. Hatred is now confused. 
Because this culture only understands this culture. Hatred begets hatred. So when hatred begets love, this culture tilts. What are you doing? You're bringing influence to this culture and making it wonder and question the validity of its culture. Come on, Jesus. It's causing them to say, wait a minute, what's wrong with you? This is what we do. I curse you. You don't bless me. You curse back. That's how it works. You bring in, I bless my enemies. They go, wait a minute, that's not the game. I post something bad about you, you get on there and you post something bad back. That's how the game is played. But when they something, say something bad about you and you say, I love you, I forgive you, that's okay. It begins to impact this culture in a way that brings confusion to the enemy. And I'm saying to you and I, this is what God has asked us to do. He's told us to come and bring this type of influence. Look what he says. I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. I'm only going to get through this phrase. One verse today. Wow. I had a bunch. That's what this means. I had a bunch. But let's look at this. I will build my church. Who's building the church? Okay, I got 15, 18% of you. Who's building the church? Jesus. Jesus. That's right. That's great. 75. So Jesus is building the church. Who's the church? (laughs) Gee, we are. (laughs) Love it. That's all right. That's okay. I'd rather have participation then <laughs> silence. <laughs> love it, love it. So let me try to get. <laughs> Maybe I should hold up a card and say, <laughs> this is the answer. <laughs> That's good. So who's building the church? <laughs> Who is the church? We are. We are. That's great. So if we're, if we're the church, why, why was I saying that? Now I forgot. Oh, yeah. And the gates... <laughs> And the gates of Hades, the word gates, look at the word gate, underline it. The word gate, it's a noun. It's a noun. It's not a verb. It's a, it's a Greek word, pule. You like that word? Pule. Anybody ever stepped in pule? It's a gate. You can't step in a gate. What are you talking about? It's, it's pule. What is a gate? A movable barrier in a fence. <laughs> Sorry, once I go off the rails, it's hard to reel it back in. <laughs> a movable barrier in a fence or a wall, a door or a gate used to close off entrance or exit. So a gate. A gate is a noun. It's a thing. It's not an action. It's not a verb. And it's used to close off entrance or exit, right? Look what he says. I will build my people. Remember your process. I'm a process. We're work in progress. He's building up a people and he's empowering them for an assignment to change culture. I will build my people up in such a way. I will take parts. I will take this. I will take different material. I will keep building my people. I will keep building my church. So much to an extent, I will empower them, I will build them structurally, and I will fill them. So I will build them and fill them with power. So then I will release them into the culture to change culture, to match my culture. And just so you know, the gates of hell, of Hades, will not prevail against you. I told you what gates means. The word prevail is a verb. And it means to overcome by superior force. To be able to be strong enough. So let's take this out. So I'm going into the culture to change the culture. I've been empowered to change the culture. And you run into a gate. Has anyone ever been chased down and attacked by a gate? 
Notice what it doesn't say. It says, I will build up my church and the swords of Hades, the machine guns of Hades, the MPGs of RPGs, sorry, <laughs> RPGs of the knives, the guns. There is no, we're not talking about something that's attacking me. Have you got it yet? The gates. Has anyone ever seen a gate chasing someone down, coming after them? I'm going to get you. I've never had a gate chase me down. I've never been assaulted by a gate. But it says the gates of Hades will not be strong enough, will not overpower the church, the people that I'm building. What are you saying, God? He's saying, I'm going to build up a people so much that as they go into the culture that I've empowered them to change, to match my culture, as they run into gates, as they run into barriers, those barriers will not be strong enough to stop them. They will not be able to stop us from entering and allowing people to exit. <laughs> I'm telling you, church, we have to understand we were built for an assignment. We are the ecclesia that we're not supposed to just be in here, hide out, and wait for the rapture. As long as we just say, God, man, this world is going to hell in a handbasket, when are you going to do something about it? He's going to say, excuse me, but I empowered you as my ecclesia to, to not just come into a room and sing a few songs, hear a sermon, and go back to your everyday life. I empowered you to be an ecclesia in the grocery store that when I highlight someone to you, you notice them and you bring the culture of heaven to them. That when you go to school and you see someone, you see a fellow classmate and they're down and they're discouraged in their countenance, you're like, wait a minute, that's not the countenance of heaven. What is going on? Maybe I need to talk to them. Maybe they're sad. Maybe they're, I don't know what's going on, but I'm just saying when you notice something, and God says, notice them, look, look, something, notice. Be a sign to us that we as the ecclesia are supposed to take the culture they're trapped in and bring them out. Well, I, I can't bring them out. They're, they're too deep. The gates of hell will not prevail against the church that he's building. Not the church that I'm building. I'm not building the church. Jesus is building the church. It's not my church to build. It's his church. He's building us, the body of Christ. I'm part of the process. I'm not the arrival point. He's the arrival point. We're all in process. And he's building me up. And pay attention, Chad, when I'm bringing people across your path in the grocery store. Oh, yeah, sorry. But here's the part we've got to remember. I'm building you up and the gates of hell will not be able to stop you. When your child is away from God, when your parents are away from God, you've got someone else and they're behind the gates, you go get them. The gates of hell are not going to stop you. How do you go get them? You go through them. You go get them in prayer and the word of God. You don't go grab them by the nap of the neck and say, you're getting out of here. I'm going to tell you. <laughs> That's probably not a good strategy. You, you get in your secret place. <laughs> Is that strong? <laughs> you get in your secret place and you begin to pray and you pray scriptures over them. You pray scriptures over them. You know what? Whenever you're praying scriptures, I imagine this in my mind. I, I, I can see it right now. I imagine that as I'm praying and I'm praying scriptures over that situation, I see those gates start shaking. 
I see them, set. they're closed, but man, they're trembling. And the more I pray, the more I confess the word of God, the more I stand on the promises of God, the more they shake and the more they tremble. I believe as we pray, all of heaven is working on behalf. It's responding to the word of God that you're praying. So if you're needing a breakthrough in your life, we've got to know the master of the breakthrough. We've got to know the one, Baal Perazim. He breaks through barriers. He breaks through bondages. We've got to know that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to pull down stronghold so we're in this culture not to be afraid of it not to talk bad about it to bash people say listen Lord I thank you that you've empowered me with the culture of heaven to come amongst them and bring your culture and make it match the culture of heaven you've been empowered to do it we're on assignment to do it we're at Ecclesia when you're at the office, when you're at your job, we need to be noticing a culture that does not match the one of heaven. When we notice it, we don't go, man, that's bad. This world's just terrible. We go, wait a minute, there's an opportunity. One of the things Richie said that I loved, he said, I just start, I consider people targets. Like targets. What an awesome phrase. Targets. He said, yeah. He said, once I feel like God is speaking to me about people, he said, I just start considering everybody a target. He said, I assume they're a target before I assume they're not. Help me, Jesus. How many people do we assume that nobody's a target, but if God has a burning bush over their head, we might say, well, I'm going to go home and pray about that and see if that's the Lord. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm just being honest. Would we be like that? Would we be like, you know, I'm up at Dairy Days last night. There's a bunch of people. If you're not familiar with Dairy Days, it's the big city. <laughs> Comes alive for two days to mega proportions. There were targets everywhere. Everywhere. So I'm trying to be aware. I'm trying to take opportunities, trying to take chances, just... Drop some nuggets, say a few things, say, hey, how you doing? This is what, this is what God's asking us as the ecclesia to do, that we're not called to come in here. Boy, that's a good sermon, Chad. I really appreciate it. Good, good word. All right, let's go home. It's for you and I to have a burning desire to see the culture of this world match the culture of heaven. You're like, I can't do that. God's not asking you to do everybody, just the ones he highlights. He didn't ask us to talk to everybody in the store. It was just the one. And I asked him, I said, so what do you think was going on? He, said, he said, well, um, I asked him his name because I felt like the Lord gave me more after I talked to him, but he got away. And I said, what did you feel like you got? I felt like the Lord told me that they're involved in witchcraft and that he is a, a prodigal that was raised in church and has ran away from God and God's calling him home. I said, you got all that? He said, yeah. But he wouldn't let me say it. So I'm like, all right, Lord, let's go for it. Let's go for it more. Let's, let's be the ecclesia. He said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Who's the church? Jesus. Who's building the church? Jesus. All right. We hope you enjoyed this message today and that you connected with Jesus. If this message has changed your life and you accepted Jesus as your Savior, well, you can text the word NEW LIFE to the number 618-243-0900. We would love to celebrate with you. If you would like to give to the ministry of The Roads Church, visit our website www.theroads.church for all of our giving options. We would also like to invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel to receive notifications of our Sunday live services and to discover more of Pastor Chad's teachings. And now we pray that you experience God's presence throughout your day.